On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. And welcome to another episode of Archie, the cleverest dog in the world. Well, we're back. But is it going to be the same as ever? No, of course it's not. Because three of the most important figures within the whole On The Track team are no longer with us. Karina, Mother and Prudence have all gone on to the great cryptozoological hunting ground in the sky. But we will continue. We will discover our new normal. And we will carry on, making sure that every episode we do honours their memory as much as possible. Enjoy. One afternoon in early September, a few days after Karina's funeral, Carl and I had had enough of sorting stuff out, and so we went out for a drive. And I decided to take him to Fremington Quay, which is a place I'm very fond of and Karina and I discovered about 10 years ago. It is one of the best places that I know around here for looking at wading birds. And as Carl told me that he'd never actually seen a little egret, well that was a state of affairs that we couldn't let continue indefinitely, could we? And so, there we went. And guess what we saw? First of all, almost within minutes of arriving, it was Wally the Comedy Rhinoceros! No, of course it wasn't. It was a very, very industrious looking little egret. When I was a boy in Hong Kong, little egrets were one of my favourite birds, and it was one of the things that I missed most when I came back to England and found that they hadn't been found here regularly for about 300 years. They became extinct in Britain due to a mixture of overhunting in the late medieval period and climate change at the start of the Little Ice Age. They were eaten at feasts to mark special occasions like the coronation feast of King Henry VI in 1429 and the enthronement of George Neville as Archbishop of York in 1465 where a thousand egrets were eaten. But the thing that really did for the species was the persecution across Europe as the egrets were in demand, or rather their feathers were in demand for decorating hats. In the first three months of 1885 alone, 750,000 egret skins were sold in London, whilst in 1887, one London dealer sold two million of them. They were confined to parts of southern Europe by the 1950s when the first conservation laws protecting the species were introduced. In fact, it rebounded more strongly than anybody would have considered possible. They started being seen in the United Kingdom more often. And then, in 1996, came the news which so many of us were waiting for. This leaguets had bred successfully in the UK for the first time in hundreds of years. In fact, if we're going to nitpick, it's the first time that they have bred successfully in the UK because the UK didn't exist last time that these animals were seen breeding in England. But little egrets are not the only species of egret to be found in Britain these days. 
And the weird thing is, none of them were here 25 years ago. After the little egret, the next species to arrive was the cattle egret, which is probably no surprise as it is one of the greatest success stories over the last 100 years. At the end of the 19th century, it was only found in parts of southern Europe and Africa. But then it suddenly expanded its range. And by the beginning of the 20th century, it was found in southern Africa and parts of South America. It reached North America in 1941 and bred in Florida in 1957. Five years later, it bred in Canada and is now seen as far west as California. In Europe, it reached southern France in 1958 and northern France in 1981 and reached Italy in 1988. It reached Australia in the 1940s and reached New Zealand 20 years later. And so, nobody was surprised when it started visiting the UK in the early years of the new century and bred here for the first time in 2008. And four years later, a third species, the Great White Egret, bred in Britain for the first time. The Great White Egret is also a very successful species which has expanded its range quite a lot in the last few decades, but nowhere near as spectacularly as has the Cattle Egret. I've not been able to find out anywhere what is the mechanism that has made these last two egret species so successful and why they have expanded their range so dramatically. Indeed, I've not even been able to find out if there's any other reason apart from the end of persecution by our own rather unpleasant and egregious species that has caused the little egret to be able to expand its range back into the places where it used to be found centuries ago. So if there's anybody out watching this who can help me with the answers to these questions, please drop me a line in the comments section below. For the last few years I've been following with great admiration the activities of the young people who have taken it upon themselves to start trying to clean up this planet. And so, as we do our bit to help, here's a shout out to a couple of them. Oh, this one is for Lily Pat. And for Flossie and the beach cleaner. But most of all, this is for Karina. When John was a boy, there were loads of these ditches and streams around the village. Each one a miniature ecosystem. Now some of them have dried up and a lot of the rest have been polluted. And this is the last healthy one left. Back at the beginning of the year, you may remember that Carl and I went out for the afternoon and spent quite a happy, if ultimately depressing, afternoon trying to catalogue the state of the various ditches and streams in the immediate vicinity of the village. And much to our dismay, we found that my favourite little stream at Huddersford had been clogged with rubbish. And we promised that we would come back very soon and clear it. Well, then came lockdown. And then, no sooner had the lockdown restrictions been lifted slightly than Karina was taken seriously ill and went into her final illness and, on the 16th of August, at Barnstable Hospice, died. However, we hadn't forgotten our promise, and on the day after her funeral, when Carl and Richard were still here with us, we went back out to Huddersford and we did our best to clear it again. We managed to remove two or three bags of rubbish, but because it was so late in the year, the undergrowth was so thick that it was almost impossible for us to get back down to the stream itself. So despite our best efforts, this is something that's going to have to wait until next winter. It may not have been as successful an excursion as we'd hoped, but, to use the words of my late mother, it blew the cobwebs away, and Archie certainly enjoyed himself rushing up and down and barking joyously, getting in everybody's way, and basically making a nuisance of himself. Dogs, eh? <laughs> Have 
you ever wondered what would happen if five of the most senior male members of the Centre for Fortune Zoology got together with a few drinks in a room and a camera talking about cryptozoological octopuses? Well, wonder no more. David, what do you think about the Lasker? Well, I'm hoping to hear about it soon. Carl, tell us about the Lasker. Uh, the Lasker is a cephalopod, that is a, an octopus type animal that's reported from around the Caribbean. Uh, I found an interesting story when I was in Belize in Central America. Um, we released a snake by this little, little lake on the edge of Altenha, which is an archaeological site of mine, the site of Pyramid. And um, we were told that it was a, a brackish lake and it was connected to the sea in the Blue Holes and there was meant to be a lusker that comes and uh, lives in there every now and again. And it was just a little story that I thought was cool. Richard, Basco. Well, the lusker, uh, in the Caribbean they call it he of the hairy hands because they say that the tentacles are fringed by kind of feelers that look like uh, hair and instead of having uh, uh, two suckers next to each other it has one big sucker going along like that on the tentacle rather than having two side by side which is uh, the setup of a group of cephalopods called cirate octopuses so the theory is that the, that the lusker is an immense cirate octopus and for Many, many years there have been sightings and accounts of octopus far bigger than the largest known octopus, which is the Pacific giant octopus, which grows to about seven metres across the, uh, the tentacles. Far bigger in the Caribbean area, and fishermen have said this thing has grabbed their catches, and when they've been trying to pull up lobster pots, the other thing's been pulling out them, and it's even attached itself to boats. And uh, the story goes that they can enter underground tunnels that lead to these pools, they're called the Blue Deeps. These are circular, brackish pools with very clear water uh, that connect up through caves to the sea. Now the thing about octopuses is, the only hard part of octopi, octopuses, what kind of English is that? Uh, the only hard part of octopi is the, the horny beak. So anything they can squeeze their beak through, they can squeeze their whole body and organs, including their brain, through. So a lusker could get through these little caves to hunt in these lakes. And there are a number of accounts of people swimming, uh, local people swimming in these um, pools, these blue deeps, and getting grabbed by something and pulled under the water. And the theory is that it's uh, the lusker, this giant undiscovered species of octopus. Even Jeremy Wade on River Monsters has had an episode on this very subject. And he seems to think that... Uh, the Lusker, yes, it is some sort of giant octopus. Then again, Jeremy Wade thought that the Loch Ness Monster was a Greenland shark. Yes, which would die in fresh water very quickly, which was a bloody silly idea. But he's not the first person to come up with the idea of the, the Lusker being a giant octopus and entering the, uh, the blue deeps and uh, attacking swimmers. I think Ivan T. Sanderson wrote about him back in the late 50s. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I didn't know anything about this until I actually went to Belize and got told the story. And do they call it Alaska in Belize? Max, I do remember from your student days that you were interested in a particularly dubious cryptid, the freshwater octopus of Oklahoma. <laughs> Which has always interested me, that even though funny. it's obviously... Yes, that was funny, even though it's obviously bollocks. Well, you haven't got the kidneys, you know. <sighs> yeah, so I, d I, I did a bit of research looking into um, mm. this bizarrely lesser-known cryptid, the freshwater octopus of, of Oklahoma, just to see if there's anything, even in cephalopod biology, which allows them to go into fresh water uh, long-term. And there are a couple of species, it's a long time ago since I last looked at this, John, so you put me on the spot here. There's a couple of species that's of squid that will go into brackish water and uh, octopi themselves can uh, cope very well with big changes in salinity if they get trapped in rock pools and things like that. But it doesn't, it doesn't tend to be from seawater to brackish water, it tends to be from 
seawater to even saltier seawater as the rock pools uh, sort of slightly dry out over a day and the salinity increases. Um, but as, as far as I can remember, there's, there's no evidence for any cephalopod being able to go into uh, fresh water long term at all. It's something to do with their kidneys, isn't it? Yeah, it was all to do with the way that they... It, it's, it's just a very fundamental part of their biology that to try and induce that change in the way that they process salts is so colossal that the chances of that actually essentially becoming evolved, bearing in mind the other hindrances to you know, octopuses and squids colonising fresh water, including very, very basic things like competition from fish who've had millions and millions of years to get very, very competitive in freshwater environments. It's very difficult to see how that's ever possible. It's a bit like trying to see, trying to think of me voting Conservative. It's, it's, it's such a colossal, colossally unlikely. And now Uncle Carl's going to be dissecting an octopus that I caught myself in a brave and titanic struggle. No, you didn't, Arch. I bought it in Tesco's. Well, at least I can eat it for my dinner. No, Arch, you're not going to eat it. We're going to be putting it in formula. So, Carl, what are we doing here with this poor, unfortunate cephalopod? Well, as we'd been talking about the Lusca recently, I thought it would be a nice idea to do a have a look at the basic anatomy, the basic external anatomy of an octopus. Well, most people, all they know is the big round head and the tentacles. Mm. But there's more, isn't there? Much more, yeah. The head, that's what you would call the mantle. Um, the mantle isn't actually connected to the main body. The water flushes through. Um, what we're about to look at now, that is the beak. The beak of the octopus is in there. The beak is in two parts. Um, it sort of sits in a, a fleshy cup, but it's not really attached to anything. So, the beak is inside that hole there? Yeah, deep down inside that hole. We'll take it out in a minute. Obviously, it'll come out in two pieces. Is it true that the beak is actually the only hard bit in the hole of the creature? Usually, yeah. Um, octopus also have a sort of rudimentary skull. Um, they've got quite a complex brain. So unlike the squid, um, the octopus actually has a sort of sh a, a, a sheet, basically, that covers its brain, um, which is basically a skull. The thing that I always find fascinating about octopuses is how they are such complex creatures but they're still just mollusks. Absolutely, I mean, it's a glorified snail, isn't it? Yeah, and the fact that they've got such a keen intelligence, I would probably say they're the most intelligent um, invertebrates. Absolutely, nothing even comes close. Problem-solving intelligence. Have you seen that film that was done a few years ago? One, it's a, one of the giant Pacific octopuses at, I think it's a sea life centre somewhere, where it is learning all, all, all sorts of very complex tasks that involve cognition rather than just... Yeah, yeah. Um, just just you know, rope learning. I'm just going to take one part of the beak out now. So is it true what Richard said then, but that as long as the hole that the octopus wants to get through is bigger than the size of the beak? Mm, a couple of millimetres bigger. What are you dropping in there? Uh, that's just to keep it so I can see what I'm doing really. I'm just cleaning it out. Is that water? Yeah, you oh. get a build-up of, of uh, uh, an ink type material. When the octopus um, pushes at the ink, is it, does it come out of that hole? No, no, the ink comes out of the siphon. 
There we go, that's the golden really? part. It's tiny. So, an oct that octopus, had it been alive, would have been get, able to get to any hole that was bigger than that tiny beak. Yeah, you can imagine it getting through something about the size of a marble. That is both fascinating and horrific. There's something incredibly scary about a creature that size being able to get to such a tiny hole. Yeah. Right, now I'm going to remove the bottom part, or the upper part. And you haven't broken it in half, it's already uh, no, it's just two. divided in two. Yeah, it's in two, and I say it's not actually connected to anything, it just sits in this little fleshy cup. Two beaks, one cup. <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. And the beak isn't that isn't that much bigger than one of the suckers. No, it's very small, isn't it? And you're, you're squirting water in again to sort Just so of, I can see what I'm doing. To wash the ink and the mucus It's out. basic, yeah, it's it's not really the ink, it's just off-coloured material that fills it up. There we go. Probably not technically mucus either, but it looks like mucus. It's just that nice to be able to see what you're doing. absolutely fantastic. You've done this before, haven't you? A couple of times, yeah. Are they always from Tesco's? <laughs> it's a nice, easy source. Mind you, Archie might have something to say about that. I tell you what, wouldn't it be fantastic one day if a giant squid does wash up... If they have washed up on North Seven Beaches before... If a giant squid washes up... We are there. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. You want to cut that out? Oh, yeah. That is totally that's awesome. It, that's it in position now. What's the beak do? What's it for? It's, all it is is for thrashing and biting into the tissues of whatever its prey is and just ripping chunks out. So it sends a bird's beak, it does yeah. the same thing. Except this isn't connected to anything really, it's, like it's just in that fleshy cup so it's quite dexterous. The other thing that I find fascinating about all cephalopods, but particularly sad about octopuses, they grow fast, they get remarkably big, they are incredibly intelligent. And they live such an incredibly short time. Yeah, very that, short. Is that the siphon? That's the siphon, yeah. So that's where it forces the ink out, which makes it move at, at a, a fast pace. And what was the other hole called? Other hole? The one that you were going to the, Oh, that was, the, that was the beak. Oh, the, the hole is called the beak, is well, it? Well, beak, the beak is just inside that little hole. I didn't... Oh, you wow. see that the mantle's not actually connected to the head of the octopus, so water flushes through there. So it's actually two different parts. Yeah. This is totally fascinating. I just feel sorry for the octopus, but I'm glad that we're not responsible for its demise. No, we are just here to, to learn, really. And it's possibly a better fate for the poor creature to be being used to show dozens of people around the world, hopefully hundreds of people around the world, how its body works and being fried up as calamari or somebody. Yeah. So, if then... If the two parts of the octopus are not connected, well, what they, holds them together? They're, well, they're just connected by that little... You see at the very top there's a, a flappy piece of material. That is connected to it there. Apparently when 
octopus become aggressive, some of the some of the fishermen on the islands they they try and uh, un, unfold the mantle and it makes the octopus let go, which is a bit cruel, but uh, apparently it doesn't do them too much harm. That's fantastic. I read somewhere, in fact I know where I read it, it was in Douglas Botting's biography of Gerald Dole, that the best way to kill an octopus is by biting into its brain. Yes, that's right, that's what I've read to I wouldn't fancy that really. I don't think I have with the octopus. <laughs> So, an octopus is actually a mollusk, like a slug or a snail? Yeah, it's a cephalopod, which basically means uh, head foot, literally. Whereas a gastropod, which is what snails are, that means stomach foot, because they walk on their stomachs. I think next time you're going to have to go to Tesco's and see if you can buy a squid. That's probably the nearest that we're going to get for the moment to you cutting up one of the monsters of the ocean, Architeuthis ducks. Yeah, I mean, in terms of their basic anatomy and, their, and some of their physiological functions, uh, squid and octopus are actually quite different. Well, both Archie and I are really looking forward to that. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. Thank you for watching this episode of On The Track. I hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something new and are interesting. And that you tune in next month. Goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this episode of On The Track. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And i just like to say on behalf of Charlotte and myself, we're really pleased to be back. Thanks for sticking with us during the hiatus, and I hope that you'll join us in future episodes. But you better hang on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So, until next time, be seeing you. Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that On The Track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at about and for people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought that people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago I decided that I was going to rebrand on the track. I thought we'd do a monthly episode of about half an hour and then in between each episode we do what I call on the track extra, which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old weird weekend. And have a look at these two examples, which I chose almost at random because I thought that you might enjoy them.